I will begin. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kasia Cordas, and I am um, a co-director of the Community for Global Health Equity. Uh, and I want to welcome you to um, the April uh, co-production of knowledge seminar. Uh, we, um, uh, this is a seminar that we've been offering on a monthly basis uh, since uh, September of last year. And we uh, are offering it because we're dedicated to the promotion of equity in education practice and research. And this seminar is something that's really important to us. Uh, we uh, examine a model of knowledge building that might be unfamiliar to some of you. Uh, by co-produced knowledge, we mean uh, uh, specifically knowledge that is developed under the auspices of a cooperative, mutually respectful relationship between people whose practice springs from academia and those whose expertise arises from lived experience uh, within a given community. And so uh, given this definition, uh, it's uh, my real pleasure to uh, welcome our two speakers uh, today. We have with us uh, Dr. Samin Hanwad and uh, uh, Devi Gopal. Uh, so I'll introduce both of them in turn. Uh, Dr. Hanwad is an assistant professor of learning sciences in the Department of Learning and uh, Instruction at UB. And his research focuses on how people learn about environmental sustainability using technology and collaborative learning approaches. Uh, his uh, most recent work focuses on how learners in different cultures uh, understand ecosystem processes and, and that, how they use this knowledge uh, in their uh, everyday life uh, and practice. He uh, works with various communities around the world, including India, Nepal, and uh, Bhutan in the Himalayas, as well as Native American communities in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, he has presented and published his work in several um, national and international venues and has uh, joined us from uh, uh, Penn State University where he's uh, taught previously. Uh, he uh, has also taught at Rutgers as well as uh, Royal uh, Timbu College in Bhutan. So uh, he uh, is certainly well-traveled and, and it, it, it's going to be fascinating to hear about his work and experiences. Uh, Davy, Gop Davy Gopal is a third year PhD student in the Curriculum uh, Instruction and Science of Learning program at UB. Her dissertation uh, focuses on the role of STEM, STEM classroom teachers in framing social scientific issues that affect the community. Uh, her other research interests um, include culturally relevant and responsive learning and teaching practices. Uh, she has a bachelor's of science uh, in environmental science and a master's of research in conservation biology. Um, she was formerly a museum educator uh, in the New York Hall of Science uh, uh, prior to transitioning to a role um, as a high school science teacher in my Micronesia and then uh, her current doctoral studies at Buffalo. She works with Dr. Honwat on various projects um, uh, and, and uh, projects that leverage storytelling as a uh, pedagogical approach to teaching science. Um, and uh, this storytelling weaves in issues of community equity and culture. So. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to have both of them uh, join us and uh, thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. I guess, no, one, one more thing, I uh, apologize. So to those of us, of you who are, um, who are listening, uh, please feel free to use the chat uh, to uh, share your reflections as well as questions uh, to, um, to our speakers. And when, when they conclude, we will also be using the Q&A. So either one of those uh, is fine. Please feel free to use those. Now the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much, Kasha. That was uh, lovely. Uh, and I'm also very grateful uh, for the uh, Global Health Community Equity um, uh, Alliance, which UB has to organize this. Uh, this is such a relevant topic. It's so close to my heart, and it's it's I oftentimes feel like it's the only way forward. So I'm so uh, grateful that um, of the mission and and the kind of people that work there and just uh, it's such a good space uh, 
um, that that I always feel like, oh, I need to hang on to these people. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, having said that, I also um, want to acknowledge uh, definitely uh, that uh, I uh, am grateful that uh, I'm on the land of the Senecas uh, and uh, that uh, I'm allowed to work here. Um, I'm also grateful, uh, again, these are some of the things which uh, I think about all the time, so this is not just uh, for the sake of the presentation, but I have the job I have because of the civil rights movements that happened in the 60s and the, uh, and the 70s in the United States. Um, so uh, having said all of that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm now going to do uh, a little sharing of slides. Uh, right here. And let's see, uh, I go into presentation mode there. All right. Um, oh, I don't know how that happened. OK. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see this, uh, so uh, um, let's move forward. So, you know, um, I have been doing this work for a while where um, I uh, have been working with communities uh, which are remote and rural um, uh, in, in the world for a while now, uh, been about 15, 16 years. And, uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about myself before um, we move on to the conversation. Uh, and uh, so I grew up in India. I uh, uh, grew up and in, uh, in, in urban India, mostly in Mumbai and Pune. So those of you who know the western part of India, uh, you would know that Mumbai is a big urban hub, and uh, that uh, uh, Pune is right next to Mumbai, and it's another urban hub now. And uh, uh, I uh, was a climbing guide for a really long time. I guided people up the mountain in the Himalayas, and uh, that's the Himalayan connection. So when I came to graduate school, I had this whole idea that I wanted to put my research in the Himalayas, and that's how I started working up there in the mountains uh, with a different hat. Um, so uh, working with communities over the years, I have realized it's a different ball game than than regular research, uh, which uh, happens in education or the social sciences or other uh, sciences. Um, and that's the ball game which I've been trying to talk about all these years. And um, that's what I'm going to sort of think about uh, uh, presenting here. Uh, also, before I begin, uh, thank you, Devi, for joining us. I wanted to give Devi a chance to say a little bit more about herself, uh, um, uh, and then we can we can move on to the next slide. Uh, thank you, Samir. Um, so as you see on the slide there, my name is Devi Gopal. My first name is Shakuntala. Most people don't refer to me as Shakuntala. It's a little hard to pronounce, um, but feel free to call me that if you ever see me around. Um, so I, um, you know, I, I this is not the track I started on. Um, as, as Kasha said earlier, my, my work revolves around um, culturally relevant and responsive teaching and learning of science, but my former track was actually down conservation biology as my master's probably indicates. And I spent a lot of time um, working in a lab, um, actually cutting retinal tissue from frogs for quite some time. And I had a hard time connecting to the field. I had a hard time connecting to um, the people that I worked with. And I think a lot of that had to do with identity issues. Um, and so I had, I, I sort of drastically transitioned to becoming this high school science teacher in, in, a, 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 in the Federated States of Micronesia for a couple of years. And it was really those students that inspired me to go down this academic track that I have um, that thinks about those students and thinks about um, how science should and can be framed differently to meet the needs of students that sort of don't, don't, uh, that are marginalized all the time in classrooms and in science in general. So, um, you know, that's how, that's how I ended up in this field. And I was I was born and raised in Queens, New York. Um, so I came I came to Buffalo because of this this doctoral program, and also to follow Dr. Hanwad and and work with him. So, um, and, and so, I this has been this has been a, a very um, tumultuous journey getting here. And in terms of uh, my academic pursuits and my interests and uh, my own identity. So this work 
that we're going to talk about today and all work that I, I probably will pursue moving forward is super close to my heart and, and I feel very um, I feel very grateful that I get to participate in it. So that's a little bit about me and my, my why I'm here talking to you today with uh, with Samir and I'm going to turn it over now to Samir to take us through the first part of our presentation. Okay, thank you, Davy. Um, so, you know, I wanted to sort of uh, um, talk about my perspective on why I think um, co-production of knowledge is important, right? Uh, um, to tell you a story, uh, so my background, just like a little bit like Davies, is in ecology. I'm a bird ecologist. I studied birds for the longest time, and my master's thesis um, was on this in this tropical forests of Western India. Um, and one day, I was going up and down the uh, the, the it's, a, it's a small mountain range like the Appalachian mountain range uh, along the western uh, coast of India. There's a mountain range called the Western Cuts, and I did most of my uh, research there very long time ago as a bird ecologist. And as I was going up and down the mountain, I realized that uh, there were these villagers who burned the mo mountain slopes uh, so that uh, their cattle would have fodder for the next year because. You clear a slope, um, new grass comes in with the new uh, rains, and that's great for the cattle. So then you could graze your cattle uh, uh, all over the forest. Uh, but here I was an ecologist, right? I was like, well, this is out of the fire regime. This is not good for the forest. Uh, the, the bird species I was studying, the great uh, hornbill, were being impacted. And I remember. Uh, I saw this villager um, actually throw a little light, lighted match into the grass to light it up and then burn through the night so that that burn would happen and then the new grass would come in as the rains came in uh, the following month. And I literally ran towards him and I yelled at him and I put the fire out and I said, you know, what the hell are you doing? Um, and of course, uh, that was, uh, when I think back, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a very, it's a story that is close to my heart because it's the story of how ignorant I was. It's the story of how uh, 20 years later I would do that differently. Because here's a villager who's living in that forest uh, who knows things around there better than I do. And it is my needs as a person living in urban India uh, is why he has to burn the land because fodder is expensive and buying fodder uh, from the outside will cost him way too much money, uh, and this is this is the way he has found to feed his cattle, and that complexity has stuck with me even after about twenty years uh, of that incident, and that was sort of the journey which I would like to highlight is that uh, that was my first realization to a certain extent that that, oh, this is a lot more complicated than what I set out to sort of, uh, or what I am trying to, uh, or how I see it. So power is, is, is something which plays a big role in how research is conducted and how uh, urban-rural relationships are formed. Uh, and, and power historically lies always with the researchers. Um, also, researchers, that power leads to one-sided narratives. Like, I have the power. I'll take the notes. I will collect the data. I can write a book which these villagers will never, ever read. And 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 I, I remember I get very uncomfortable when, when my other researchers' friends sort of come, researcher friends uh, joke about the fact that uh, occasionally they'll say, oh, I hope these guys never find out what I'm writing about them. And, and those are all... Uh, uh, conditions, uh, or those are all things which come out of this one-sided narrative, uh, out of out of uh, the power we have as researchers. Also, then the ultimate thing is like when I was studying uh, it, it, hornbills in in the Western Cots, I always wondered, like, I'm studying hornbills, but how does the study of this hornbill? Um, have anything to do with the communities uh, who li reside in the forest. Uh, hornbills are important because they're beautiful birds and I have, as a researcher, decided that they are gorgeous and worth my attention. And of course, people are excited about it. Um, there's When I would walk into a room of ecologists and say, oh, I study hornbills, I would get the respect I need to get because there were other ecologists who were studying elephants and, and tigers and, and flora and fauna or this tiny beetle in the most interior forests of, of, of uh, Western India. 
and and uh, it would be exciting. But why does this, all this matter? The so what questions, right? So what if the hornbills are are disappearing from the western guts of India? Um, so all of this uh, has stuck with me all these years, and even today I ask this question all the time: okay, Why am I doing what I'm doing? And that leads me to talk to more people to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, to get input, to grow, to sort of uh, uh, make sure that uh, I check my privilege at times in different places, uh, all of those things, right? And that is the reason why I feel, uh, and this is my perspective of, of why co-production of knowledge is an important and a very um, interesting and fascinating endeavor. Uh, Okay, so oh, I don't know why. Oh. But uh, co-producing knowledge is not a very easy task, right? It it sounds lovely and it's uh, amazing. You just go sit with people and they'll spill out the knowledge <laughs> is how it sounds. But, you know, as we know, and I'm sure everybody uh, in this forum uh, is interested in this idea and has this level of understanding that this is a complex space place to be in where where you have to be constantly uncomfortable. Um, like uncomfortableness is the normative in the space where you're co-creating knowledge because you know there are power differences you have to manage. There are implicit biases which we have to check occasionally or get checked. Um, our positionality is important. Uh, there are issues of equity within local communities, uh, and I can I can tell you a story about each of these uh, sections which I have put up here. Like the equity issue is huge, right? Like for example, working with the tribe. Uh, my positionality as a researcher is that I'm an outsider, and I see that there are issues of patriarchy, there are issues of uh, you know uh, uh, class uh, within the tribe, and yet. Uh, my positionality as an outsider um, dictates how I address those issues of equity. Uh, my positionality as an uh, as an outsider makes me think about okay, what are my biases uh, toward when I'm viewing into this community, and that dictates how I actually uh, work with the tribe, how I co-produce the knowledge which is supposed to be co-produced with the tribe. A trust is a huge thing. A uh, trust actually is the foundation of how you can actually co-produce any kind of knowledge, not just knowledge with the community or researchers. If you don't have trust, you don't have the relationship um, that exists. And of course, all of this um, intersectionality is it needs to be considered while you're doing this work. So every single day, you are you are in a space of at least ten times. You're thinking, "Oh my gosh, I don't know this. What do I do now?" Um, and, and that's the space of uncomfortableness which one has to be used to. Um, uh, Davy and I had a running joke last year while we were uh, working on the field where we would talk about being in the muck constantly. Uh, that's the space of uncomfortableness which uh, I believe one has to get used to. It, and that should be the norm. If you're not uncomfortable, you're doing something wrong. Uh, so co-producing of knowledge if you ask me, it requires the base of it all lies with with building partnerships. Um, you know, building partnerships is sort of the crux of the story, right? Where you move away from uh, going the, in there as a researcher to help the community and moving towards genuinely getting to know the people, like building these friendships of which are real, which you know, which you want, which will sustain you for a really long time. Uh, this is not a relationship of, oh, I come in and collect data and then we co-produce knowledge. No. Uh, or this one I have seen all the time, right? Like when people say, oh, participatory design, I'll say, oh, you know, I got this $1 million grant. Will you work with me? I will pay you, say, 10% of this grant. And then the members of the community are like, sure, 10% of the grant sounds great. And then when I go back, back to writing about this, I oftentimes say, oh, this is a participatory project because I went and asked them and they willingly participated in the project. That is not what these partnerships are all about. These partnerships are about genuine relationships which you develop because you care about one another. 
because you care to make the world a better place, as cheesy as it sounds, right? Also, one of the bigger bigger things is like moving as researchers, I, I feel like moving away from assuming that research has all the answers is also very important. Like moving away from the smugness of saying, well, evidence-based research shows, uh, maybe not, right? Accepting that there is a big, big, big space out there where I don't know is a, is a word you will have to use all the time is, is not a, such a bad idea. That is the only way you can create genuine partnerships or relationships. So building partnerships is the foundation of any kind of co-production of knowledge. Um, well, what does it take then to build these partnerships, right? And I, I, these days I purposefully shy away from using uh, using words such as co-producing knowledge. Uh, and uh, in simple terms, right? What does it take? Showing up. You know, people think that this is easy, but in our busy lives, uh, showing up is a huge, huge, huge thing. You show up multiple times for different things and just sometimes to drink tea. That goes a long way in building these partnerships. Um, Listening is another one. Um, I, I find it very useful to just sit and listen and ask questions uh, uh, based on that listening, right? Genuinely sit there and listen to these stories. But again, uh, you have to realize that you are not there because, because you want your research to be done or something. You're there to build genuine partnerships. Genuine partnerships uh, require you to listen. Um, you need to expand your boundaries, right? Uh, we all know that uh, in our lives, we learn to uh, draw boundaries. Uh, a lot of people in my department are constantly telling me, you know, you should say no more often because you will get overextended, you will burn out. Uh, and I would like to say yes more often than what I, I actually uh, think about. I, I want to say yes, and I want to say yes, and then say, hey, you know what? I love this thing. I would love to know more. However, here's all the commitments I have. Uh, therefore, what do you think? How can I participate in this better? Um, so I would like to do that, right? I would like to change how I say no or yes. So that's me expanding my boundaries, right? In our world today, we are taught how to constantly draw boundaries. I think we need to expand them much more. Uh, if we want to do this kind of work again. Uh, moving away from individualism, I think, uh, you know, uh, the the settler colonial mentality of uh, me and myself and uh, I am happy with my local little um, environment is, is not sustainable anymore. Our problems are are global uh, as we are in a pandemic, which was, which is a great learning experience. Gone on the day, gone are the days when when you had this uh, local person in a community uh, somewhere in the middle of New Hampshire uh, saying, oh, I'm happy here and I will look for local things and that is great. Um, gone are the days, we cannot do that anymore. Climate change is another one, right? Uh, our actions, what we do here will impact other uh, places and, 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 and people on the planet. Um, Trust building, right? So, so be genuine. Whatever your agenda is, tell it to people. Like, for example, it is entirely possible that co-production of knowledge itself is an agenda you have, which other people don't. So, so you're coming there and saying, oh, I want to co-produce knowledge with you, which is an agenda. But be honest about that. Uh, uh, and and uh, I have heard this so many different times that researchers will come back and say, well, I want this to be participatory, but it is not participatory because they don't want to participate in a way which I think they should participate. So think about that a little bit um, and go in there with an idea that, look, let's build trust. Let's think about all of these different things, um, which, um, which together, uh, let's talk about our, uh, the ways we are living in this world. Let's talk about uh, our our lives a little bit. Um, so blur, uh, blurring those boundaries, like sort of saying that, oh, the professional and a personal sort of need to sort of uh, come together at some point in a middle ground. Uh, 
like for example, I I, I remember this uh, very this this is a story which um, probably uh, some of you uh, might have heard is that I was at a workshop in NASA and I was talking to them about relationship building and I was I was invited to this workshop um, to talk about building relationships and uh, I was like sure I can do that and I was like oh relationship building is really important. Um, because if you see uh, in science, if you're friends with the people you work with, your work will automatically be better. Um, if you look at all the people who have won Nobel Prize together for the same project, they're either married to each other or are best friends. And that friendships are the thing that drives good research. Uh, if you're friends with somebody, you will work with them better. You will, work will be happier. And, and uh, that was, I had a, a postdoc uh, at, at that seminar who got up and then, and he said, that's just, she said, that's just ridiculous. You expect me to go and have a beer with my advisor? And I was like, well, yeah, if he's not creepy, sure. <laughs> Why not? Right. Um, and she's like, this is, this is, uh, this is not possible. You can't, uh, there needs to be lines. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, I, that, that whole workshop was three days, uh, uh, after my presentation, Nobody ever talked to me. Um, everybody thought my ideas were ridiculous. But it sounds simple, but these are difficult things to do in our lives. Um, uh, and again, if we want to do the work we do with human beings in a way that is genuine to get out information that will help us all of humanity do better things, then yes, these are things which one needs to do, right? There needs to be spaces where you can talk about your differences, um, where uh, we need to sort of say, yeah, you know, I think about this differently because of my positionality, because of my background, because of uh, where I come from. Uh, so, uh, so again, um, these are some of the things which I have uh, learned from experience that uh, that they are important when you're building these partnerships. And, and, you know, one can also say that these are challenges, uh, you know, all the lists which I, which I um, put out there, all the things on the earlier slide, these are challenges which can, which can um, uh, take place while you're doing this kind of work, right? Like, for example, the one of the biggest challenges which I think about is, is uh, you know, once you go to uh, co-produce knowledge with the community or once you do some kind of participatory work, you oftentimes land up participating with people who have time, money, and the privilege. And that's, you know, that's, that's something which you have to keep at the back of your mind. I do not know how to mitigate that, but one has to realize that, that who you are partnering with in the community is something which is very important for you to ask and notice. Um, and that sort of leads to the other challenge, right? How do you make sure that all the community voices are being heard? How do you make sure that as, as a researcher, um, you can sort of uh, make sure that other people are also included in a conversation? Now, think about it in this way, right? So in my earlier slide, I, I talked about building those relationships, but if you are friends with somebody, you can actually have these conversations which are easy to have, right? You can say, uh, uh, over a dinner or a lunch conversation or over coffee, you can say, hey, you know, I noticed that there's these, these other people in the community who are not included. Uh, what's up with that? That can be an easier conversation if you have the trust with your partners. Um, so that's one way to look at it, right? Um, also, again, being inclusive is very important and it's a challenge when you are doing work together in any setting we know how hard it is to be inclusive so but when you have trust then you can talk about these things which makes the solution to the problem we have of inclusivity easier right and as i said earlier also you know remembering at the back of our minds that that um this idea of designing participatory research spaces or co or co-producing knowledge itself is an agenda which you go with and that maybe just maybe people don't want to do that maybe sometimes they are looking for answers and they want the answers so it gets tricky um, but ultimately uh, what i have noticed is that if you have trust and a relationship with your partners which uh, has been built over a period of time, uh, 
these issues sort of are a, you're able to handle them through dialogue through sort of talking about those things um so uh so yeah uh these are some of the challenges which i've seen over a period of time so i i'm a learning scientist and uh i make partnerships with the community uh, to design uh learning spaces or spaces for learning if you may and for me specifically i'm very interested in this idea of environmental problem solving, how people solve uh, different kinds of environmental problems in their community and how then you teach young people in the community to talk about uh, or, or to learn about um, uh, these problem solving, um, complex problem solving uh, uh, sort of ways or pathways, if you may. So early on, um, one of the things which I also realized is that uh, working with youth uh, is a non-threatening way of entering any new community. So when I work, started work in the mountains and I said, oh, I want to work with the school children, uh, it, it, it was very, oh, yeah, that's Samir. He works with the school children, the high school children, and he's friends with them. So it sort of gave me a nice little uh, entryway into the community, which was non-threatening, um, that I was the teacher. I could go there, I could hang out with the kids. I got to know so many things about the community, right? I got to know, uh, and kids will tell you, um, if you work with youth, youth are, youth oftentimes are not diplomatic. They'll tell you what is bought right off the bat. So, um, so then I wanted to sort of see how, number one, I can also um, start to think about co-producing knowledge with the kids or sort of teach them how to co-produce knowledge in terms of these complex problems, how to bring in the community into the classroom and classroom in, uh, into the community. Um, and in that way, I also felt like, okay, how can I then better understand what is going on within the community? So uh, storytelling was a way to move, move forward with it. And a couple of things that we are going to highlight today is, is this approach of storytelling, which uh, um, Davey and I work on in different settings, um, and we have tried it in different forms also, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so storytelling uh, allowed us to sort of get a glimpse of what is going on in the community in this way, which was really powerful. Uh, plus, we got to sort of talk to the youth about, look, um, community knowledge and school knowledge and outside knowledge, all of these knowledges can be brought together and you can have a very complex, sophisticated understanding of a scientific phenomena when you bring all of this knowledge together. Um, and um, also uh, over a period of time, I have realized that uh, when, you when I started working with all of these schools and uh, all of these young people, uh, they took me to their families. I could sit with the families, talk a little bit about education, and then slowly and steadily build uh, some kind of long-term relationship with these uh, communities in the mountains and also uh, with the Coeur tribe in Idaho. Um, so um, storytelling is a pathway which has allowed us to sort of merge knowledge systems together, um, sort of get this idea of co-production of knowledge in the classrooms a little bit. So we are going to talk a little bit about that in that regard. So again, um, I, I love this uh, little graphic uh, and, and I wanted to emphasize that, you know, why is this important? Again, uh, in terms of why should the kids know about co-production of knowledge? Why should we think about it from a standpoint of learning? Uh, so if you look at the blue sort of uh, uh, see there, that is the time we spend in communities and outside schools, while the orange part is the uh, is the formal education piece. So, uh, so the amount of time we spend outside of the classroom is way bigger than the amount of time you spend inside the classroom. However, when it comes to uh, science learning or any kind of formal learning, we always say, oh, this is more important than that. But Essentially, you want to merge these two things together. That is what co-production of knowledge is, right? Formal and informal need to sort of come together uh, and they need to complement each other so that your brain makes the connections it needs to make in, un in order to understand the phenomena better. Um, 
So similarly, if you look at this, right, another graphic, which I love always, and I use it a lot, is sort of the amount of time you spend in your home and community is a lot more than the amount of time you spend in school or your professional life or your work or wherever it is that you go um, in terms of formal education. Uh, so um, so again, uh, this is in terms of youth. I'm, I don't, I'm not talking about adults in general, but uh, youth spend a lot of time uh, in homes and communities rather than in schools. So again, co-production knowledge becomes equally important, like co-production in terms of merging different kinds of knowledge systems together uh, becomes extremely important uh, in classrooms. You teach this to the kids early on. Uh, you're, I'm hoping that that will carry with them forward uh, and they'll learn something better out of this. So, so here's an example, right? Um, how does this all work out and in other, uh, to give you another perspective of why this has become so important, right? This is a, a, this is a story from the New York Times, uh, which came out in 2017 about a teacher who was teaching climate change to uh, kids of, uh, to a community uh, where the kids were kids of coal miners. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, and uh, the story started with saying that, okay, here's a teacher who wanted to sort of talk about climate change, who's passionate about climate change, but the the kids there did not, the high school kids did not care, or students uh, did not care about climate change because their parents were losing their jobs because there was a policy in place during the Obama administration, which was uh, sort of cutting back on the coal rather than uh, rather than keeping going. And that itself is such a complex problem, right? And every single young person in that, in that classroom um, hated the teacher. They did not believe in climate change. And there was complete isolation of science uh, in this way, which was very unproductive, right? So complex problems demand that we teach our kids uh, to co-produce knowledge, to merge different knowledge systems together. And if you ourselves are not able to do it, I think then modeling that kind of behavior would be uh, is, is a poor sort of um, model or an example we will show the kids. So, so uh, this is this story is is such the such a crux of where we are at in the world today. Like COVID is another example, right? That that uh, how, I don't know how I have uh, luckily, fortunately, touch wood, me and my family were protected from COVID in different ways because we are privileged because we are able to sit in our houses and not go to school. So uh, we have a, a higher amount of protection. We don't have to go out and earn money in order to bring the food on the table. So I can easily think that, oh, this is a problem which doesn't affect me and therefore it doesn't exist. Um, so complex problems require us to sort of build, uh, bring in different knowledge systems together, bring in different understandings together. And that's why you know, the co-production of knowledge thing is so important. And, and, and we are looking at ways on how we can teach our kids, uh, meaning the young people in the school today to sort of say, okay, this is an important thing. How can you build these partnerships? How can you ask these questions to your community members? How can you bring in community knowledge into the, into the classroom or, or into, into the work you're doing, right? And uh, as a learning scientist, I'm fortunate to say that uh, we've been, we've been uh, uh, there's a group of people uh, out there who talk and develop theories around this, right? So, uh, for example, um, uh, now there's a huge push to build a research practice partnerships, which is all designed all around this idea of co-production of knowledge, where you sort of go into uh, a, a community, may it be a school, may it be a, a village community, whichever community, and you you talk about your needs and and there are processes which are laid out, which um, sort of think about how researchers can build productive partnerships with the community. And these are some theories, uh, frameworks, which are put out there for researchers to talk about these uh, um, uh, these uh, exercises which they're doing in terms of uh, building uh, partnerships for co-production of knowledge. Um, so I'll hand it over to Davey. Now we're going to highlight some of our work, right? How, yes, the first step is to build a sort of a community and then how do we sort of replicate those models in the classroom through storytelling? So 
just to give you a flavor of what we work on. So I'm going to hand, our, hand it over to Devi. She's going to talk about a few examples. Uh, so I'll keep it quiet now. Thank you, Samir. Um, so like this slide says, Tales from the Field. So we're going to highlight three different projects. Um, two of them are, I don't want to say they're complete, but um, we, we have some um, examples of stories that students have created as a result of this process of co-production of knowledge like Samir has highlighted um, for us in all these wonderful slides in this discussion. And then we have one project that we're gonna talk about um, that's that's very much in the beginning stages of, of building partnerships and, and what that journey has really been like. So Samir, if you had a slide. Yes. So the first project we're gonna talk about is called Working for Educational Equity, Scientists, Artists, and International Design. We've highlighted these initial letters, um, these first letters because we call it WESED. Um, so you can see the acronym there. Um, and, and in this project, um, this happened just last summer, we recruited students to create comics about COVID-19. So the comics were the stories um, manifested for these students. Um, so we developed a program that was initially actually supposed to be an in-person design about food systems, but because of the pandemic and all the restrictions that were instituted as a result of the pandemic, we sort of quickly switched gears. Um, and so we developed this program that uses storytelling to examine how students make these connections between science, equity, and community um, when considering a complex socio-scientific problem. So before it was supposed to be food systems, but because of the because of COVID-19 and um, all the information we were learning about how it had been um, affecting communi um, communities inequitably and how it had been altering everyday life, we decided to, to use that as our complex socio-scientific um, prob um, problem. So this program was three weeks long. It engaged 13 high school students from India, the US and Mexico. Um, and all of these students were recruited through these long-term existing partnerships that um, Samir had. Um, and, and was able to extend this opportunity to students that they knew would be interested in creating comics about some scientific issue um, and considering these um, social aspects. Um, so uh, if you go back one more, Samir, oh, not yet. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I hope I can go back because I may not be able to. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit more information before you see that slide. Um, uh, we had students uh, do a little bit of local research. So when I say local research, I mean, we had them talk to their family and their friends. We had them do some research online and read articles about how COVID-19 had been affecting their communities. Um, because again, those students were, were from a wide diversity of places. Um, and then we had these conversations over the course of three weeks that focused on the scientific community and equity elements of, um, of COVID-19 and how it had been affecting all of these people differently. So they developed storylines and then comics that they either drew or created using a software called Pixton. And what resulted was these complex narratives that did in fact weave together culture, community, and science. So I'm going to show you two examples. Um, and Samir, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and advance that slide. So this first example um, was from a student from India. And her comic was called Govinpur Bites Back. And she creates an author's note here that kind of describes um, where this story came from and the liberty she took with it. And, and I, it might be a little hard for you to read. I, I'm not sure, depending on the device you're using, but she talks about how it's, um, it, it's a real life event that she learned about that occurred in a village in India. And it took place, she even wrote when it took place in April, 2020, uh, when everyone was being affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And what she did is that she actually um, took some creative liberties in developing, this, developing out this story. Um, and, and so what she has here is um, the, the entire story was about uh, a family and how they had been experiencing COVID-19 in their village. And then one of the main characters is this um, person, the student who is wearing this orange t-shirt. And um, he is very upset throughout the comic because school has been shut down. He hasn't been able to access his lessons. He hasn't been able to see his friends or get together socially with any of his schoolmates. Um, so. Um, I've, I've, we've created a slide with a few panels that really highlights um, elements that weave together this community culture and science um, as reflected in the rest of the story. So in this upper right side, this panel, uh, we have the, the main character's parents talking about livelihood issues. You know, how are they going to find, um, how are they going to access bread to put on the table? You know, and they're talking about how the pandemic has affected their son 
and um, how they don't know what's going to happen and how their son has been feeling really down. And in the p panel right below it, we see the students throwing this book down and feeling really upset um, while he's outside wearing his mask. And his mother is asking, what happened? Why are you throwing your books? And, and he's just he's just frustrated. And um, she, she, she creates these panels to really show the differences and how various community members are affected differently, even within the village by COVID-19, right? And in this bottom left-hand panel, we see kind of, this is kind of um, the end of the story where the teacher, so the, the individual wearing yellow, um, he calls, I, I think a friend um, and realizes, you know, here's a local solution we can use in light of the fact that all of these students don't have access to technology and internet in the same ways um, another place might be. So here's a solution. Maybe we can use these speakers and, and set up these speakers and, and, and um, sort of blast the lessons um, every day so that everybody can, can gather at a so and socially distant outside and still hear these lessons. Um, and, and it works out. I mean, that was, that was ended up being the, the end of the story um, that, that, that the student in orange was happy because he was then able to access his lessons. Um, so this, this student being able to, the student who made the comic, the comic artist, she was really able to ground her understanding of this scientific issue in these social elements that she really depicts in multiple ways visually and um, in terms of the storyline and the dialogue um, that she that she has um, depicted in her comic. So Samir, if you go on to the next slide, I'll show you another example. Um, and this comic was not hand drawn. This was one using um, that software tool called uh, a software called called Pixton. And this story is really different. So this student is a, 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 an American student, and she created a story about these two teenagers who are in a relationship, and they come from very different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and these differences in socioeconomic backgrounds really influences the way they're experiencing the pandemic. Um, so she has one student named Ebony, who's a black student, a black female. And then she has one student who is white, this white male, the one in the, the, the red hoodie. Um, and the, the crux of the story is that um, Ebony, Ebony's mom has two jobs because she's trying to make ends meet, um, especially that his been made more difficult because of the pandemic. And then you see in this first set of panels, actually, she even writes, Zach's mother had bought stacks of toilet paper, gallons of hand sanitizer, cans of Lysol, and masks for a lifetime. To, and, and in this way, she's trying to present the fact that Zach comes from privilege and he has a lot of access to resources um, that you need to keep um, yourself and your family and your community safe, that she um, sort of implies that Ebony does not have in the same ways. So what happens is that Ebony and Zach um, are, are having a conversation in another set of panels that are not depicted on the screen. And Zach asks her and her mother to come over for dinner. Um, but that ends up throwing Ebony in this internal crisis because um, her, first of all, her mother works two jobs. So it might not have been possible, but also Ebony is really kind of ashamed. She doesn't want Zach to see um, to, to know that she is less privileged than he is, um, which has become more evident because of this pandemic and her lack and her family's lack of resources. Um, so she's just afraid. And that's really what's depicted in these last three set of panels on the bottom uh, where she says, you know, I don't want him to look at me differently. Um, so so Jalen, Jalen um, the artist, the comic artist is also weaving together community culture and science by drawing out these really big differences in the way these two individuals, these two high school students are experiencing COVID-19 grounded in these socioeconomic differences um, that they have. So, so it was really, it was just such a wonderful set of weeks because we had students that come from such different backgrounds that were able to share with one another how their lived realities have changed. Um, and in talking about how their lived realities have changed, they were able to talk about what their lived realities are. Um, in, the, in their different cultural contexts. Um, and, and so, you know, the, this, this opportunity to build these storylines and these comics shows, um, allowed these students to see how these scientific phenomena are, are really intimately tied to our realities um, and, and how those realities are different based on these intersectional ide identities that we carry. Um, so it really allowed them to see the implication and the importance of this scientific issue.
So if you advance to the next slide, I'll start talking about our next, another project that we wanted to highlight called Weaving Strands of Knowledge. And I've highlighted Weaving Strands because um, we call it Weaving Strands. In fact, I forgot it was called Weaving Strands of Knowledge. I was just thinking it was called Weaving Strands. Um, so this is a project that's actually two years old. Um, actually, it's older than that. I, I only came on for the second iteration of the project, uh, which happened in, in India, in Western coastal India. And um, these are three images just to, to to give you a sense of what these students were doing. It's really different in this case. As you see, they're all holding microphones. They were not creating comics, they were creating podcasts. So we had this project where we had these rural and urban um, students identify local environmental problems and create podcasts about those problems. So like I, you can see in, this, in these images that we've chosen to put on this slide, um, students went out into their communities and they interviewed people. Um, some were people they knew, some were people they didn't know, some were scientists, some were not. Um, and, and they were able to use all of those stories to um, use all the narratives they captured to create a story. Um, a story surrounding the environmental topic that they would have chosen. So this was a project that occurred over two weeks. Um, and, and it was made possible again because of these long term existing partnerships that Samir has. In fact, one of their team members is someone who currently lives in India, and she um, is a is is one of Samir's long. I think you've been friends probably for decades at this point. So, um, so she she was able to connect us to these schools that were um, that trusted us to come in and and run this program with their students. So, Samir, if you move on to the next slide. Um, we want to provide you an example of what a podcast sounds like that really weaves in these different elements, again, of culture, um, science, and community. And what you see on the, on the slide here, we'll talk about afterwards, but it's just a storyboard that's actually directly taken from a paper we published a little while ago. Um, so I, I think, Samir, you'll play the podcast. It's just six minutes long. Um, yeah, we, as you said, you, we may not play the whole thing, but I'll have to yeah. stop sharing and then uh, move to the podcast. So sure. So yeah, so while you do that, I'll talk a little bit about it. So um, we'll, we'll play maybe the first three minutes of, of the podcast. I think that's more than enough time to hear, um, to hear what the story is and how they approached um, talking about, in this case, urban deforestation in their, in their community. Um, so it was a group of students oh, and they, oh no, it's okay. It was just a group of students and this is just one of many, a, a couple of podcasts they created. Um, and we're happy to share the link with you if you're interested in listening to the whole thing. But Samir, go ahead. My name is Mirosh. My name is Nolan. We are team anti-deforestation. We go to Bharatya Vidya Bhavan School. We live in South Goa. Goa is known for its beaches, architecture, and peaceful environment. Tourists come to Goa to escape the stresses of life and enjoy food like fish curry, rice, and chorus pub. Unfortunately, Goa is not like it was in the olden days. In the past, Goa was less populated had fewer houses and had more greenery and fields. Due to the development of the state, the experience of living in Goa has changed. The days are getting hotter and nights are getting cooler. There has been a decrease in animal and plants and a loss of their natural habitat. So in order to learn more about this issue, we decided to talk to people about deforestation in Goa. First, we interviewed an ecologist named Shraddha to understand what deforestation is. Deforestation is an introduction of exotic species of uh, plants, uh, which competes with the local and the indigenous variety of species, and it does not really allow the local species to, to grow comfortably. Next, we talk to people to learn about Goa in the past. I spoke to my grandma, a family friend, dad and mom, and this is what they said. Oh, during our childhood, we used to run to the hills to collect and to uh, pluck various forest fruits like uh, tsunna and binda and un, and we used to enjoy them. But now you hardly see them around. Uh, the people used to live in palm leaves houses, huts and all. And But now we don't see such small huts. Like if you see tall buildings come up, but the other side, all the trees have been cut off. We don't see the those beautiful greenery which we used to see early during our childhood. We see all the monkeys coming from the hills, our house side, roaming on the tiles of the house. Because they don't have a place to live in. 
there were times where ecotourism, green tourism was something which even we as young children would just love. Going to the beach, going over the mountains, finding beautiful uh, trees and fruits, which you no longer see today. Well, Goa during my childhood was much, much greener. We had a lot of access to hills. And I remember going to the hills on a small hikes, uh, picking up wild berries. There were different flora and fauna. Even a small change in the vegetation, the f uh, flora that was uh, prevalent earlier is no longer available now. I, I uh, remember a particular plant called a tiger claws, which is no longer existent now. And even so, so, so many uh, varieties of endemic plants are missing in today's vegetation that even the uh, number of butterflies have, has decreased. I wanted to know why deforestation is happening in the first place. So Nolan interviewed his dad and a family friend to investigate. Defo should we should we play the whole thing or? No, I think that's okay. fine. So Stay thank you. Plainton. Oh, should we stop? Yeah, let's we'll stop. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Samir. So okay. if you put that back in present mode, thank you. So um, so like I like we said, um, we're we're happy to share that link with you um, if you'd like to listen to the whole thing. But we just want to be considerate of time. And a few more things that we'd like to highlight. Um, but as you so so what this schema here shows you is, is literally what the story map was for. Um, how they decided to talk about this scientific issue of urban deforestation. You know, they started with Shradha, who is a scientist and a team member on the project. Um, and then they, they spent a lot of time talking about or, or um, including these perspectives from family members. Um, and, and other folks, interviewer B and interviewer C, if you listen on, if you listen on it at a later point, are just different people that they went out into the community and spoke to in order to really parse this issue of urban deforestation and the importance and implications of it. Um, so as you see here, you know, they were able to weave together lots of different knowledge about, about this very scientific issue um, and, and weaving together perspectives um, from people who have very important um, perspectives but are not typically regarded as experts. Um, so it, it really allowed them to um, make this issue more relevant to their realities um, and, and bridging what they may have learned in the classroom, like Samir was talking about earlier and, and all the spaces outside of the classroom. So Samir, if you go on to the next slide, I'm gonna now move on to the third project, which is one that's very much in progress. Um, and when I say in progress, I mean at very much at the beginning stages of building these partnerships. So we've just talked about um, these two projects that have come to some conclusion in terms of producing something, a story um, that uh, that has been made possible because of these partnerships, um, because of this project, um, and because of the students and the participants in our work, um, and because of this co-production of knowledge made possible by all of the above, right? Um, so this last project we're going to highlight is one that really um, focuses more on you know, what, what, it, what is involved in, in partnership building and, and how the complexities of partnership building. So this is actually my, my hopeful dissertation work and um, it's going to be done in Guyana. So, I, so we have a map there um, and the arrow showing you Guyana. It looks pretty small in comparison to Brazil, but it's the only English speaking country in South America and it's the country my family is from. Um, and uh, Guyana has a history wrought uh, with lots of um, imperialism because of because uh, of a lot of siphoning of resources. Um, in fact, it, it, lots of siphoning of resources because of the enslavement of um, African people that were brought to the country to cut cane for sugar, and then the replacement of them by indentured laborers um, that were taken from India, which is how my lineage ended up in Guyana. So in, in addition to a lot of other places. Um, so what my research focuses on is um, is this massive amount of oil that they found in the country. Now, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of oil. It's so much oil that um, one thing that has stuck with me in a talk I, was, I attended um, about this oil issue is, is that it's so much oil that it's more than Venezuela had at the height of its, um, at the height of its economy. So, so I've showed you here three um, headlines of articles taken from Forbes, taken from the Washington, um, the, the Wall Street Journal, taken from Open Oil that just kind of shows you um, how, what, a big, what a big issue it is. So 
I'm interested in examining how teachers frame this scientific issue in their classrooms and what they use to frame it. You know, do they, do they use their sociopolitical identities to develop this consciousness around this issue? Do they, um, do they premise it with the history of extraction in the country? Do they um, see ExxonMobil as, as a suspicious body or do they see it as a good thing? Do they see it as an opportunity for folks to have um, jobs because Guyana is an extremely poor country in, in that regard? Um, you know, what, what goes into those conversations if those conversations are happening at all? Um, so I'm hoping to build some narratives that describe how teachers see these issue, um, see this see this issue. Um, so Samir, if you go on to the next slide. So I'm in the process of forming these partnerships, um, and and you know Samir has highlighted these this process of needing to show up, really listen, expand your boundaries, move away from individualism, build trust, and really talk about these differences. So in my process of building partnerships, I I've, I've realized because of the complexity of the questions that I'm asking, I really need to talk to a wide variety of people and really build this trust in these partnerships with folks who belong to different um, spheres, different social spheres. So I've, I, we have here a circle that represents governmental, one local, one academic, because um, for the, the Ministry of Education in the country is a, is a federal body. Um, so so th those are people that I have to have conversations with. Of course, you want to highlight the local people, just other people who don't belong to an academic space or a governmental space and how they see this um, and, and what they see is important for highlighting um, in this in this research and these research questions. And academic, of course, you know, just at the university, there's one accredited university of the in the country that develops, um, that produces research, um, the University of Guyana. So, um, it's just been such an interesting process of, of what it means, of, of learning what it means to show up, listen, expand boundaries, et cetera, because every sphere has such different ideas and um, feelings around research in general, first of all, and this very specific research and these research questions. Um, and, and just to, to really ground this, you know, one of the conversations just the other week I had with someone, a, a governmental person, um, you know, they, the advice I received was to remove the word political from the entire, um, from the manuscript, you know, they want to make this apolitical and they really want to focus on the importance of moving away from didactic teaching practices. Um, from the, you know, the local sphere, a lot of folks that I've spoken to, um, and some of them being teachers, um, they, they want more transparency in what's even going on because it seems like a lot of folks are not talking about this, they're not talking about it at all, the only place that they even hear about it is in news articles and a lot of times international news articles. And then the academic sphere, you know, they wanna improve publication out of the university um, and out of the country and really get the word out about the complexities of this issue. So, you know, everybody has a different agenda like Samir was talking about earlier. And, um, and I constantly am in this self-reflection about where I fit in and how I make sure everybody's being heard and all their wishes are being um, sort of represented and manifested in this research. Um, and then where, what, what my positionality is, because while my family is from Guyana, I am first generation. So I'm not seen in the same light um, as a first generation American, um, as somebody who was born and raised in the country. So that really draws some differences that I need to think about um, and, and think about uh, how that influences my interactions, like that circle with a bunch of people in the middle that Samir was um, referring to earlier. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I just, I've just had so many experiences that have already been so unexpected. You know, one of the first relationships I formed was with the former national science coordinator and we spent hours together on the phone, in person, where she just talked to me about her life and, and her daughter and why she actually left the role she left and why she left the country because actually I met her right as she was migrating out of the country um, for a lot of really important reasons for the research that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I spent hours on the phone with her daughter, um, offering her daughter some advice about college because her daughter has now is attending Fordham University in New York. So that's, that's fabulous. But, you know, it, it's, it's taken um, more than I think many folks are willing to offer to build this trust um, and build this relationship. But it's, it's turned out into this not only beautiful friendship, but it's also, you know, she has been 
uh, one of my primary contacts for getting in touch and building trust between these other bodies and these other individuals that now I'm in, I'm in constant um, in frequent communication with. So um, it's taken a lot of time, but important, um, important time. So um, I, I have these little arrows here to represent that it's it's a cycle. It's it's an iterative process. You know, you're always needing to show up. You're always needing to listen. You're always needing to expand in your boundaries. It's not a one and done deal. You're not just doing it for the beginning of the project and then it's over. Um, so yeah, so that's that's been my story with building partnerships, and 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 that those two other projects are um, some stories that Samir and I share um, in terms of projects that we've both worked on and how that's panned out. Um, and yeah, so so that's if you Samir, if you move on to the next slide, you know that's pretty much our presentation. And if anybody has questions, we welcome them. Thank you so much. Thank you both for uh, for sharing these uh, great examples and stories. And Davy, certainly, thank you for walking us through your experience and and actually sort of uh, giving us. Um, real ways in which you are addressing the points that Samir made at the beginning of the presentation. So thank you both for that. Um, we uh, want to um, open this to questions and reflections from our audience. Uh, you know, anybody should feel free to type their questions into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, so um, we want to make sure that, uh, that your questions are addressed. And if you have any reflections uh, to share from your own experiences, uh, then please go ahead and, and do that now. Um, and I don't want to monopolize the time. Ooh, we have one. So this one is from uh, Leah. Uh, with regard to financial incentives, how do you ensure participation is genuine while respecting free time is a luxury not all have? It's a great, great question. question. Yeah. I, I love that question because I, I talk about this all, all the time. And uh, Leah, thank you very much. Um, time is precious. And, and one has to realize that time is some... Uh, so you know this idea of free time right is so interesting to me um because um oftentimes uh yeah you're absolutely right right so this is my job and i can um i, I can be uh, just say oh i am going to go and find out uh, how these people in so and so community is going going to live life uh, and i'm like oh let me go and have coffee with them so of course uh, they're busy individuals they are that's where the blurring of the boundaries becomes really important, right? So, so you have to sort of think about things in their time, right? So, for example, you may not work nine to five. You might have to work uh, after five or on the weekends or whenever they have time, right? So, um, I would go to the mountains and I would be like, "Oh, I w uh, could we could we talk tomorrow about this issue we are doing?" And then they would be like, "Yeah, sure, come between nine and ten in the morning," and I'd be like, "Okay." And then I would go there and they'd be doing other things, and then I would uh, actually have to wait till twelve uh, in the afternoon, and then to be like, "Oh, we're so sorry, have lunch and go," and then I would be like, "My entire day would be a wash," right? So. So absolutely, like managing that time uh, is is something which is really, really important. Really, really something you have to think about all the time. Uh, um, you have to run those, you know, balances of things, and also, uh, or you have to sort of balance things out in different ways. Uh, but but that's where sort of you cannot think of this as a, in the normative way we think about work. Um, and that's why I highlighted those things earlier on that that this is not this is I, I hate to use the word non-normative, but this is something which researchers have to realize that that things will not happen on your time. Things will happen on other people's time. Um, like a, when I started my work in Bhutan about now 15 years ago, I remember going to the country and and I would sit for hours waiting for people to come and talk to me. And, and at one point I started questioning uh, 
uh, well, is this worth it? Uh, what, what am I doing here? Um, am I interested? Until I found the right people to work with. Uh, and once you put in, once you have that trust, once you have, then things become easier, right? Right now, uh, I'm able to fly into Bhutan, get whatever data I want to get, um, come back, talk about it the way I want to talk about it. And my partners trust me. My partners trust me that, uh, or the collaborative collaborations I have, there's a lot of trust there. But I had to do the work beforehand, right? That, that yeah, you know, I had to go sit there. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, this is a, a very good question. I, I, but it is a it is a tricky one. I, uh, and that's why you really have to be invested. You really need to like your work. That's the other problem, is that you really need to like the people you are with. Otherwise, you're, it's going to be a burden. And if it's a burden, then it's not going to be genuine. Um, you are going to sort of uh, not like it. So, so yeah. Uh, and then uh, financial incentives. Yeah, you know, money is always uh, something which is a challenge. But it's also, and I, I'm not like, just to put it out there, I'm not like one of those people who's like thinking glass half full all the time, just so you know. I'm very cynical about about the world. Uh, but, you know, I take pride in like getting small amounts of money and doing big things. I have realized that it doesn't take a whole lot of money. If you have the good relationships that you have with people, it doesn't take a lot of money to do, like the project um, uh, Davey highlighted uh, on, on the comic book thing, it literally was less than $500, I would say, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and I could pull it out of uh, my professional development last year and and get it done. But it sort of secured the partnerships I had with a lot of the principals in India and in, in the South, uh, which actually uh, they were struggling with what to do with these kids now. Uh, so we were like, oh, we'll take the, take you take them off of your hand for like a month. And uh, they were excited about it. Um, and all the kids showed up. It was a volunteer program and everybody showed up. And kids in India... Um, worked at night. Uh, kids in the United States got up at eight in the morning, which was crazy. They they were there every single day at eight in the morning, uh, and it was uh, wonderful. Of course, um, uh, uh, yeah. So you know, it these are important things to consider. But if you really you know like the work, um, yeah, uh, it. it you it's a balance which you have to sort of uh, negotiate all the time all the time it's not there's no easy answer um so sorry if you were looking for a silver bullet but there is none <laughs> thank you samir um before i move on to the next question uh david do you have anything that you'd like to add yeah i'll just add that that um i think that's 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 very much the value of co-production of knowledge you know there's there's an investment from multiple bodies in this research or this project that you are developing in partnership with these individuals. Um, and you'd be surprised how much of an incentive that is um, for people to, to be able to be heard and, and for their voices to be valued. Thank you. So we have two more questions. I'm going to go to the Q&A, which came in first, and then I'll answer the, the second one in the chat. So this one is from Claire. Uh, thank you both for being so open and genuine with your talk. I'm thinking about the advice to blur boundaries and the conflict that comes up in human relationships and navigating those effectively, um, especially if when relationships have toxic elements and affect students or people with less power do you have any advice oh, yeah you know my gosh uh, uh, I don't have advice as much as I have experiences so uh, uh, you know thanks Claire uh, thanks for coming I also see Jessica there Jessica by the way was a big part of the we said project Jessica skates um, uh, and uh, she was a very integral part of the comic book project which we did uh, uh, so thank you for that so uh, um, Claire, so, you know, we've, Claire and I, have we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but, uh, like one of the other grants, which I run, um, uh, or I'm, I run in the sense I participate in as a PI, um, it involves Native American communities in the Pacific Northwest and, and, 
And, you know, that is one of the most diverse projects I have participated in. We have, we have uh, uh, officials from the tribe, uh, the director of education, who's uh, Coeur d'Alene herself, Native herself. And then we have uh, um, a professor of education who's of uh, Chinese origin. She's first generation Chinese. And then we had this uh, engineering dude who was uh, German, Irish, uh, white guy and then there was me and then there's Davy and there's this English woman so it was like crazy diverse and it didn't happen by plan it just came out it happened and for some reason people were super duper uh, not willing to talk about their differences as much as I wanted to talk about the differences and and that did lead to a little bit of a problem um, and there was lots of toxicity at some point uh, uh, as we move forward, everybody felt really uncomfortable all the time, uh, in a in a in a bad way. Uh, so, um, but there were lessons to be learned, right? That the only thing that helped me through that project was uh, some of the relationships who I could talk to about these issues. So, for example, it wasn't you know we we term it as gossip, right? That you have a problem, you go to somebody and say, oh, they're doing this, they're doing this, and oftentimes that is considered not good, but in this case, it helps. When you ask for help that, hey, look, I am at the end of my rope and can somebody else help me? I've talked to a bunch of people. What should I do? How should I do this? What are your thoughts? I have a group of people who counseled me through a problem I was having um, with this uh, engineering white dude. Uh, uh, who eventually landed up leaving the project because it was just he didn't think it was going really well and there was a bunch of other things. So, but I had a, every time there was an issue with some of the project members, I have this like it's literally a council of friends who do this kind of work who I can go to and I could say, What should I do? And literally, I have asked this question at least five times to these group of people. Uh, and, and they will they will call me, they will advise me, we will talk about, oh, and this and this and this. Uh, so building, having that council of friends which will help you do this work is really important. Um, your core group of people. Uh, and that takes a while, right, to build. Uh, and also build, being willing to ask for help. Uh, I, I think all of us are trained, and that's where the individuality and the settler colonial mentality comes in where you're like, oh, I'm not going to ask for help because I can do this by myself. Asking help means that you're weak. I think let's move away from that. Uh, this is, you are not, you do not know everything that is happening when you enter a world like this. Uh, and accepting that is very humbling. Um, so saying, look, I'm at, the, I'm at my wit's end. What can I do is extremely important. And it's really hard. I can assure you that much also, especially after you get a PhD and you have a large NSF grant and you are like, oh, I have a $1.4 million grant. I know everything. It is bloody hard to sort of be humble and say, you know what, Claire, can you call me? I need to talk. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I think uh, that's something which uh, has... I, have, I, I work on every single day. I have to ask for help. I reach out to people. I counsel. I, uh, sometimes I just sit in the muck. And sometimes I go, and this is really, um, this is all research to me. Sometimes I go running for nine miles at a speed, which is insane, which makes my feet hurt. And at the end, I'm like, ah, I'm t my feet are killing me. And But I have peace of mind. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, those are all the strategies that are completely acceptable. Amy, what about you? Um, you know, I was thinking, I was reflecting on Samir's response, and I was thinking about, um, it's interesting because I interpreted that question really differently, um, only in terms of positioning of myself in, re in reaction to that question. So, you know, I'm often the person with the least amount of power in a lot of spaces as a student, as a, as a, as a woman of color. Um, as a person who tends to look a little bit younger than I am, like there are a lot of reasons why I, because I'm short, you know, there's a lot of reasons why um, I tend to have a lot of, a lot less power in spaces. And I'm thinking about um, what, what, uh, what happens when there are conflicts with individuals 
in professional spaces, whatever that really means. And um, I think the biggest elements for me is, is that trust that Samir was talking about earlier and trust that the person or the people that I have this conflict with also want to move forward and are willing to acknowledge where they went wrong. And I'm that I'm willing to acknowledge where I went wrong and acknowledge those power differences. Um, I, find, I, feel, I often feel most suspicious of individuals who don't acknowledge those power differences and don't acknowledge what the issue is. And also is unwilling to see um, my perspective. And, and, when, and I always try to make sure that I'm seeing the other person's perspective and, and holding them. Um, holding holding them as someone who has my best interests in heart, you know, and, and and I try to move forward in those kinds of professional relationships in the same way. Great. Thank you both. So we're going to close with a question from Jessica, even though I'm sure there's more, but we need to wrap up. Um, so uh, Jessica says, an excellent presentation. Thanks to you all. Uh, Devi, you shared some, uh, Devi. You shared uh, some excellent advice for other doctoral students who want to invest the time and energy into their work in the same way you have. How do you balance this work with staying on track? Um, I feel like I don't have a real great answer to that question because I often will call and freak out to Samir about how much time has been has gone and how little I have done. But I, you know, I, I think what I'm learning in this process is that. Um, one big thing and one great piece of advice that Samir has given me in this process has been prioritizing, you know, like, it, you know, it, when you want to do this kind of research, this whole, you know, this whole presentation has been about, um, you know, this co-production knowledge, but also forming these relationships and these partnerships and making sure you have patience and time um, devoted to this, to that cause. So, you know, when you have a list of things to do, I make a lot of lists. Um, when you have a list of things to do, you think about, you know, what, what needs to go number one. And for me, oftentimes, you know, if there are people I need to respond to um, in conversations that I need to have in order to maintain that trust and maintain that partnership, that's what I'll do first in the day, you know, but if it's a response about an email, but a document, you know, that might be something I do a little later in the day or the next day, you know. Um, so I feel like it's about making sure you know what your priorities are and why and how that what implications those priorities have for you as a budding researcher. Um, but that's all I have so far. Maybe that'll grow over time. Thanks, Jess. Wonderful. Well, thank you both uh, for joining us and, and sharing uh, as, um, as our uh, attendees have said so, so wonderfully and, and candidly. Uh, and thank you to our attendees for, for their great questions. So uh, we're gonna sign off now, look for this video uh, on our, um, we will be sharing this and, and um, uh, uploading it to our YouTube channel. And there will be one final session on May 11th. Um, everybody's invited. This will be with many of our prior speakers and we'll have a conversation uh, that reflects on the series uh, throughout the year. So again, thank you and uh, see you next month. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.